Hello world, thanks for joining Pivot Conference and welcome to this session. I am Dani Merino, I'm talking to you from Madrid in Spain. I am the R&D lead inside of Project in Space, so it was not really a surprise uh, when I was told to moderate the two sessions that are coming on uh, right now that will be focused on R&D and what we've been doing through our Pivot competitions to help raise geothermal above uh, the current baseline. Yeah. Uh, as I said, we have two. This is the second competition, but Pivot is, Pivot is four years old. Yeah, this is, this initiative did not start from the beginning of Pivot, but it came to a reality when, after a number of conversations with the geothermal ecosystem, it was clear that there was a growing enthusiasm and there was a, a, a many fresh ideas coming to the table, but some of them, or many of them, very cool ones, were not really getting funded. Yeah, so uh, in the end, there was some sort of a, a, um, valley of the death. Those of you that know us uh, in inner space know that we're working a lot on first of a kind demonstrations, but you have to understand that there are many other, maybe that's the deepest one, but you have also other valleys of death at other stages of development in, in R&D. So that's why in Pivot, we decided to launch a competition that, that is philanthropically funded, yeah, so that every year we select two initiatives that we will fund for one year in a very unfiltered way. If you come from oil and gas, no problem. If you go for heat, electricity, we don't really put any criteria at the beginning. If it's shallow, deep, it doesn't really matter. All we care about is about the opportunity to disrupt, to bring something impactful that will transform the geothermal industry. Yeah, Because all we want to do is to try to scale as much as possible the use of geothermal. Yeah? So in about half an hour, we're going to uh, present our second contest. But it was important to have also a view of what happened through this year with our uh, winners, winner and runner up for the competition. Yeah. Uh, so we will have a conversation today with Jerome Sphere from Texas AM and with Zeynep Magabi from HEAT. But before I forget, I also wanted to mention that last year's competition is available in our YouTube channel, which is a luxury because you have around 120 hours of knowledge about geothermal available for everybody. But just going back to the main topic today, uh, I wanted to welcome both Zeynep and, and Jerome. Hi, Zeynep. Uh, let me introduce for a second Zeynep. She's the co-executive director of Home Energy Efficiency Team, that's HEAT, which is a non-profit incubator from Massachusetts that is currently working on shallow geothermal networks. And this is what I like the most, the pivoting of a big industry like the gas utilities into geothermal. Yeah, this aligns perfectly with the title of our conference series. Yeah, uh, and the HEAT was the runner-up last year. Uh, uh, with the development of a digital twin for the first networks that they're running in Massachusetts. It's, it's actually run by Eversource. And uh, they recently received a thumbs up from the DOE uh, because they, they, got a, they were awarded a very significant grant as well to continue uh, with the scale up of their uh, heating networks. Yeah? And Jerome, uh, Jerome Sfer, she was the winner last year's competition. He's a PhD candidate from Texas AM under the guidance of Jean-Luc Priot and George Moridis in the Department of Civil and en Environmental Engineering. Uh, he, he got the prize because of his work with the rigorous modeling of flow through fractures and the challenges associated to optimizing how we're extracting heat from the subsurface, maybe looking more into EGS systems and electricity production. So you see that <laughs> I ha somehow have a challenging job to try to merge the two worlds that we have in geothermal, the shallow, the deep, the thermal and the electricity. So that's where I'm going to ask the audience to maybe help me because you know you have a bottom at the at the bottom of the screen you have a, a, the opportunity to write questions. So I challenge the audience to maybe write a good one that will help me create a nice dialogue with my um, with with my friends Zeynep and Jerome. So after this introduction, uh, hi Jerome, how are you? Hi, good. And you? I'm fantastic. Let Let's maybe tell our audience. How's it going? How's your project going? What have you done through the year? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. So first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, our team is composed of uh, Dr. George Moridis, Dr. Jean-Louis Briot, and not doctor yet myself, uh, Jerome Sfer. Uh, so we started working on a fully detailed base case model, replicating an as general as possible EGS reservoir. Uh, and we started by studying in detail all the details that can be set up in this model, going from the geometry, discretization, and the rock properties, which vary between the permeability and porosity to the very details of the composite thermal conductivity model, for example, and so on. 
So this took a lot of time at the beginning and we kept on optimizing this base case model to be an as accurate and as replicative to reality model. And then we ran this model for 30 years and we started to study the behavior uh, of the uh, EGS reservoir. And we monitored the global reservoir scale properties such as the pressure and temperature distributions and at areas of interest such as at the injection and production wells. And then after doing that and getting a good understanding of how it is behaving, we started doing sensitivities and modifications on a one parameter by parameter uh, basis to try to identify and investigate how these changes are affecting the overall response of the system. And so we studied how each change would affect the global reservoir response, such as the global temperature and pressure distributions along the reservoir, how the cooling front propagates into the fracture and into the rock matrix and so on. And also looking at production metrics, which are affected by the global reservoir response, such as the production rates, temperature, and the thermal energy produced, which is the main product that we're looking at. And then the main criteria for evaluation was to maintain optimal thermal energy production over the longest period of time, which, is, which reflects both the hydraulic performance of the EGS reservoir and the thermal performance. And then the sensitivities that we were doing would vary, for example, such as the well spacing or the hydraulic fracture attributes going to aperture, height, and width, which all of those depend on the geomechanical state of the system or at the permeability of both the fracture and the, uh, and the rock matrix, or the heterogeneity of the permeability distribution, for example, and a lot of other parameters, such as the initial temperature, pressure, conditions in the system. We also explored the possibility of uh, the recharge of an EGS, which didn't look uh, promising. And after doing that, we also looked at uh, the CO2 versus water debate, which everyone is going through right now. And what we did is we studied the performance of this same model under different thermodynamic conditions using either water or CO2, because both uh, CO2 and water exhibit very different thermophysical properties uh, under different temperature and pressure combinations. So that's what we were trying to identify if we can find a sweet spot where one wins over the other. And mainly, the main limitation we were able to see is that CO2 has very poor thermal attributes compared to water, but has other advantages that would uh, allow CO2 to exhibit better uh, flow rates, production rates, and flow regimes in the, in the subsurface, such as its low density, a potential thermal siphoning effect, and so on. And then where we are, we are at right now is we are trying to incorporate natural fractures into the system. So then now we have the rock matrix, the natural fracture network, and the hydraulic fracture. And now it's a completely different uh, system. We are using the MINT approach, which was developed at the Berkeley National Lab. Uh, it is a dual porosity, dual per, uh, permeability model. And it is very challenging. We're still working on it right now. And uh, it is very complex and may not reflect reality properly, but it will uh, it will definitely give an appropriate idea of how to what to expect from a naturally fractured system compared to a system that is not as naturally fractured uh, and so on. So that's where we are at now. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, project. Uh, I would like to thank Project Innerspace for supporting us and especially Danny for always uh, meeting with me, chatting about the, and getting comments about the latest developments of this research. Totally unscripted, eh? No, 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 we didn't plan this in advance. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, uh, because, I mean, I've also done a PhD, but in the end, it's all about planning, trying to develop something, and then there's always something that moves you in a different yeah. direction. So so what was your, you, your your turn to the left or to the right? What did you what what did you have to change from your original plan? What 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 results made you you know shift a little bit the scope of the project? Well, initially, uh, mainly it was in the CO two case because I had better expectations from CO two and it let me down. Uh, we had this discussion before the project with uh, my advisors and they were against the idea because they were not convinced about CO two and I told them that. I want to investigate that and let's see what we what we get. And then 
of course, they had to tell me, we told you so <laughs> halfway through the project. So uh, that's one thing that was unexpected. And I also did not plan on working on the naturally fractured system initially. But as we go uh, and how I saw the behavior of an EGS, I saw that it would be very important to, uh, to see how a natural fracture system would uh, differentiate and how it would affect it. And it turned out to affect it a lot and it's a completely different system right now. So that's something that would be very important uh, in the industry because there are so many challenges into mapping and characterizing these natural fractures and it is very important to see uh, their impact on the overall performance. And that is the most important thing in the PhD is how to continue. No, what are the what they're leaving behind for the rest of the for the next student that comes in, right? Maybe. Thank yeah. you, Jerome. <laughs> that was a great explanation of, uh, and I'm sure it's it's been uh, <laughs> both painful and and, <laughs> and great through your PhD. Zeynep, how are you? I'm good. And by I the way, it's been a long day. No, it's yeah. not just PhDs. That's all of life, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please let our audience know how how is it going with heat. Absolutely. Um, so it's it's going really well. Uh, and of course, you know, when you get to that challenge question, yeah, everything. Um, we uh, are are really happy that our proposal to create a digital twin of the. Um, network geothermal um, installation that is currently going in the ground in Massachusetts. There's um, at least three that will be installed over the next year or two. And one of them is uh, nearly completely installed. Um, we've created a, a model of it, um, thanks to help from NREL and, uh, and Lawrence Berkeley Labs, uh, and have that first um, iteration complete. Um, Lawrence Berkeley Labs will now be adding hydrology, um, which uh, a lot of, um, the reason this model is necessary is because we have great models for the ground source heat pump boreholes. Um, and what we don't have is how they interact when you interconnect them with an ambient temperature loop. Um, and that is a fairly simple uh, technology and yet it kind of has emergent properties. It's a very interesting thing to model. Um, and because of the bi-directionality of thermal flow, it's also, uh, that, that adds a little more interest in the modeling. So we, we started out um, building a reduced order model with NREL using Modelica and a full physics model with Lawrence Berkeley Labs using um, Tuff uh, coupled to Modelica. So um, the end result at the moment uh, is that the biggest challenge is of course the data. Our goal is to take these models, including the one we have currently, and to make them better and better year by year by putting in real uh, real life data from multiple projects. Um, and so uh, over the course of the past year, we have actually gone out, gotten our boots dirty, put fiber optic cable into the ground in uh, four boreholes in Massachusetts, um, and uh, are, are continuing to do so with as projects uh, go in the ground and working with Eversource Gas and National Grid Gas to arrange to have full instrumentation of these projects, far more than the typical project would have, um, and a great flow of data to us and our model to keep making them better. And the, the hope, of course, is that by doing so, we're de-risking this technology for gas utilities to scale and take this to meet the needs of buildings um, across the country. Uh, and by de-risking, I mean, we are using the model to optimize both performance, design, and operations. Um, and we haven't gotten there yet, but we're really, really grateful to Interspace and to you and everyone for helping us get to the point where we have a working model um, despite all of the barriers. <laughs> so thank you. It sounds great. In the end, you have a situation where you're going to have massive amounts of data, yes. rigorous models, and you can apply a hybrid model to it and try to be as reactive in, in the in the good sense as real-time reaction, no? uh, to, to, to be able to optimize the whole network where you may be combining loads and needs that are, are complex, yes, but like, manageable, right? Don't you think? Yes, that is exactly where we're, we hope to go, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, 
in the end, both of you are, are working with rigorous models, but in the end, the reality is moving you into having to adapt and react quickly, yeah? And whenever everybody's working with models, there's always this one parameter. And I'm trying to make the questions to both of you because in the yeah. end, both of you probably have this parameter in the back of your head. Say, this is the one that I would like that people help me and measure and give me better characterization so that my model works better. So so which what, which parameter would that be? Which variable we should be maybe investing more money in measuring in real life? <laughs> if, if it's more than one, please go ahead. <laughs> You know, we have we have a multi-page data list. Uh, so I'm really tempted to say every single one of them. Uh, but if I have to boil it down and say there's one parameter, I, I think um, there's actually a great deal of debate about how to efficiently and effectively with enough accuracy actually measure um, thermal energy for metering, for customer billing. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people say B2 meters and then there's um uh, they're they're very high cost so there's a big debate about that despite the fact that a temperature and flow you know sensor is dirt cheap and and basic yeah. uh, so I'm putting that out there to people like come on world let's get some really efficient basic cheap low cost let's cover the world with with um thermal uh, metrics fantastic Zeynep Jerome. Anything on factual mapping or what yeah, kind of you, you, parameter you, said, you would like to see? You said it. So as we started the project trying to set up a base case model that would be very common, commonly encountered in reality. And then when we started, it's like, okay, where do we start now? And it's basically everything. And what did not help is that you don't have as many as much data available for EGS. You don't have a plant in every an EGS plant in every city to be able to use this data from. And what I would emphasize on the hydraulic fracture and the natural fracture properties, those measurements are crucial. And most of the time there's gonna be a high uncertainty associated with those measurements, but they are still very important because changing it by 10 or 20% would still affect the overall performance of the, of the model. And I was telling Zainab earlier that my, my professor told me that the most accurate model you can get is at the end of a project, because that's when you have all the data, all the measurements available, so you can finally calibrate to 100% your model. So I would emphasize on the fracture properties. Yeah. Fantastic. Zainab, did you want to say anything? You, you know, I, we, we were having, we were chatting beforehand, and one of the things I was, I was telling Jerome is just how challenging um, the flow of data is and the more data, the more accurate the model, where do you stop? So I, I love that phrase that we're, wherever you are is the most accurate model you've got. Yeah, yep. you never stop in the end, right? You, you keep on improving and optimizing further. Uh, Jerome, I wanted to ask you because in the end, Texas AM is a very well-known petroleum engineer, a lot of legacy in the oil and gas. How do they see geothermal? Do they look to you over the shoulder? Do they invite <laughs> you to parties or you're That's... left behind because you're on geothermal? How is that, that relationship going? I think it's mixed feelings, but it's trending positively uh, lately. So I started discussing geothermal with my advisors maybe two or three years ago when I first started. And back then until now, I can see that there's a lot of geothermal activity picking up at Texas A&M and a lot of petroleum engineering professors and students are getting more uh, active in the geothermal space. We are establishing or established our geothermal rising chapter at Texas A&M uh, this semester. So we're picking up pace. So and there is uh, some synergy with all departments, including petroleum, mechanical, geology, geophysics and so on, because we need to leverage this petroleum Absolutely. engineering knowledge for geothermal. Excellent. And I mean, you, you probably Zainer, also have hit a lot of walls when, when you're like stakeholder management. But yeah. is it changing? I mean, versus the gas utilities or even versus the, the, the general public, the, the clients, what was the thing that maybe surprised you the most in that relationship, how things were getting probably better and better? The momentum is actually pretty stunning. I, I mean, the the growth in interest um, across the public, across legislators and regulators and decision makers, across um, gas utilities, we've gone in, in less than two years from two gas utilities we're working with to 17. Wow. 
And um, there's the the federal government in the U.S. the the IRA um, funding has changed the economics dramatically. It just seems to be almost like a gold rush feeling uh, of this is where we have to go. This is what we have to do. Uh, And the the challenges are workforce, um, good models uh, (laughs) and 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 knowledgeable people to guide the way. All right. Well, if I may ask in terms of I mean, because we're running close to the limit, I want to talk about the future. Do you see yourself expanding maybe to Texas where maybe a person like Jerome that is finishing his PhD is looking for a job, could help with his <laughs> rigorous background? Sleep. What, what are you thinking about expanding, Zeneb? So we try to actually make our plans not by our actual capacity or resources, but about by what the world or the system needs to have happen. So yes, we absolutely are going to continue to try to scale impact to the best of our ability. We've launched a Gas to Geo Wiki. Um, we have a we have received over five million dollars in funding for a research team with the National Labs moving forward, um, and uh, we have a position open, Jerome, for a science director. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Texas, yes, absolutely. Uh, I hope that every U.S. state, and I know there's already beginnings in several uh, European countries. I, I think we share everything we have open source. And we cool. want you to take it, run with it, make it better. So we'll put out this model. Um, we'll put out everything else we've got. And uh, we're hoping it goes totally global as fast as we can possibly go. Fantastic. I, I see you're becoming friends even virtually. But in the end, there's also a question that I wanted to ask you about. Like You maybe represent more of the shallow geothermal world. Of Jerome course. is maybe more on the deep. Do you yeah. think that we're talking with a single voice? Because in the end, it's all geothermal. It's all subsurface energy that we want to use. How how is that going? You think we're speaking with a single voice? I, I don't think we are, but I think a whole bunch of wonderful groups like Interspace are are trying, and and we're getting there. We have the same last name, geothermal. If yeah. we look <laughs> maybe like a family of technologies together, we can cradle the ele- the energy system of the future, providing baseload power to the electric grid and building a thermal grid and providing baseload thermal to the thermal grid. And together, we, geothermal, will actually be necessary to get to any of our climate goals. If I may add to this, I think that we we complement, we will complement each other. One, one will eventually boom before the other. It's just a matter of time. And once one of them is proven viable uh, and efficient and scalable, then all the eyes will be turned towards the the second one, and then geothermal will rule the world eventually. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good end. slogan as well, yeah. And by the way, uh, any deep hot geopower that has excess thermal that is near a thermal network, once you've built a thermal network, you have a thermal market. We can use the power, so it works together also physically and synergistically. Okay, I'll let you know then. All right. That's it. That's a great, uh, great debate. Thanks a lot. I wanted to, we're running out of time. I wanted to ask you a last question. More than that, just a favor. If you can look into the camera and talk to the next participants of the R&D contest, what would you tell them? Ah. Keep going. Don't stop, right? Yep. Keep yep. pushing. Keep convincing professors to move into geothermal, for example. <laughs> yeah. Yep, absolutely. Maybe. Yeah, and then so of the R and D manager, he's boring. Yeah, yeah. And failure is success, right? That's yeah. part of what I yeah. mean. To keep going, like, yeah, you're going to make a, at least a hundred mistakes in order to get there. So enjoy. Yeah. Good luck. I, I wish we could publish and discuss in open presentations more mistakes. Yeah, that that's a great, great point of view. Yes. Fantastic, Jerome uh, Zeynep. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for the. Uh, Nice conversation and good luck. I mean, you're, you're doing a great job, both of you. Uh, we Thanks. expect to continue watching you and seeing your success uh, in your careers in geothermal. Thanks Thank you. Thank you.